Dr. Mike Dix is the holder of the Wes and Lou Watkins Chair in International Trade and Economic Development. He's also a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics. And Dr. Dix has uh, literally a lifetime of international experience, dating back to uh, when he was a little bit younger in the Peace Corps in Kenya, which became a lifelong relationship with Kenya for him. <coughs> He's traveled uh, far and wide. His development experience, I think it's worth noting, is has been uh, one, one of the hallmarks of his experience. It's been, it's been in some of the, the hardest, most difficult countries to work in. For example, Sierra Leone, which ranks literally at the bottom of the income scale of countries. But Dr. Dix uh, dug right in and developed a good program there. He's also uh, one of the uh, nation's experts on agricultural policy. I'm talking now domestically in the United States. And that's a skill that combines very well with international development. Uh, since Dr. Dix received his doctorate, he's had some impact on every farm bill that's come out since then. Well known on Capitol Hill in that, in that role as a domestic uh, policy expert in the agricultural sector. And uh, today I would like to introduce Dr. Dix because he has, uh, he has a program in the Wes Watkins Distinguished Lectureship. Today's topic is on one of the softer areas, but one of the more important areas related to international trade. And so to introduce our speaker, I help, please help me welcome to the podium, Dr. Mike Dix. Thanks, David. Uh, David is the uh, he didn't tell you that, he's the Vice President for uh, International Studies and Outreach, is that yes. right? Okay. They, they changed that name quite a bit, so I, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always a little leery about what we But uh, uh, David, thanks for those remarks. Uh, welcome to everybody and, and thank you for coming. Uh, this is the, as, as uh, David said, this is the Lou and Wes Watkins uh, Distinguished Lectureship that we do uh, twice a year. and. Uh, Again, this is, this is going to be my last official duty as the, uh, as the Watkins Chair, and I couldn't ask for a better way to, to end my tenure uh, than uh, what I'm doing here today. You know, I've been at OSU uh, 24 years, and uh, uh, my kids and I got together this weekend and, and put together uh, uh, a list of, of everybody that, uh, that I've helped get overseas, and that came out to uh, uh, 489 students, and, uh, and 26 of those as Peace Corps volunteers. And uh, we've accomplished food, energy, health, small business development, and water projects in 14 countries on every continent except Antarctica. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoy that. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's something that I think is, uh, has been very fulfilling for me. I, I, will, I will tell you two things that uh, I think is really interesting, and, and, and I'm bringing this up because uh, our speaker today is going to talk about that, is, is uh, often when I talk to groups about international development, I tell them that, you know, I can tell you a lot about international development. Mostly, I can tell you what not to do, right? And, you know, I, can, I have had more failures than anybody I think should, should have to go through, and I can only, I can only remember uh, uh, two times that we were successful. So, uh, the, but the point is, I guess when I look back at this, and my, my, uh, my daughter reminded me that, that success comes in a lot of ways, and uh, there, are, there are, are people in this room that have been with me overseas and, and now are, are enjoying that overseas experience and learning that culture. And that's really the success. It's not what we've done for everybody else. It's what we've done for ourselves uh, by learning that, uh, that experience. And, and really, this, this comes down to two things that I've tried to accomplish in my tenure. Uh, one uh, is to provide an experience for our students to learn the skills, their skills, by applying them. A lot of you uh, go through school and you learn a lot of stuff in classrooms, but you don't seem to have the confidence when you get overseas about what to do and, and how to use those skills. And so by going over and using those things, you know, you gain that confidence of doing that. And you may not change anybody's life, but you're going to change yourself and you're going to learn from that. So that's, that was the first objective I've had. 
And then the second one is uh, to provide an, uh, an opportunity for our students and communities to learn about another culture. Right? I mean, so as you've seen the world in the last year, it's amazing uh, when you get on the social uh, uh, web pages what you hear people say about those guys or these guys. Right? And those of you that have been overseas know that some of that isn't true. Right? People are people wherever you go, and it's really important to learn about those cultures. Today we have someone uh, with us that, that grew up in another culture, uh, learned English by immersion in the American culture on the West Coast, and has 15 years of international business development experience throughout the world. I first met Valerie in Portland at an annual meeting of the National Association of Small Business International Trade Educators. It's the first time I've ever been to that, and I was, I was really impressed with this association, how close-knit they are, and how, how much they work together, and how much they share the knowledge that they've gained from around the world. Valerie specializes in international troubleshooting, cross-cultural mediation, intercultural communication, and international strategies for management executives. Her skill set is highly sought after through her firm, International Passport, and as the international business expert for the Huffington Post and the Vancouver Business Journal. Through, through talking with Valerie, I learned that many of the observations that I've gained from nearly 40 years working overseas in the development world are including in are included in a, in a curriculum that she has called Professional Passport, Work Anywhere with Confidence. What I find interesting is that uh, Valerie has worked overseas for 15 years, and, and uh, you know, every time I get together with her, it's a great learning experience for me. And I've had four years of experience. So, what, so, so I'm a very slow learner, but she's a very good teacher. I believe that Valerie's focus on culture and the importance of learning these cultures as a prerequisite for success internationally is the single most important message that Oklahomans need to hear if Oklahomans become a global citizen in the future. I just was attending a, a couple weeks ago the Oklahoma Academy for Excellence and they had a, a town hall meeting of, of, of people from throughout Oklahoma and the topic was where in the world is Oklahoma in 2032? And uh, one of the things that they wanted to do was figure out what things that the government, the state government, and the institutions of Oklahoma need to do to get Oklahoma into the world in 2032. And one of the statistics that was brought forth is uh, only one out of ten people in Oklahoma has ever attempted a foreign language. Right? We're the 43rd state in terms of the percentage of people with a passport. Uh, and I can't tell you how many students I've had that the first experience that they've had outside their own county is coming to Stillwater, Oklahoma. So with that behind you, right, you can understand how important it is that we get students overseas and to learn, uh, learn about those cultures. So today we have a speaker, uh, Valerie Antoinette Brissett Price, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the cultural dimension to all this business overseas. So please help me welcome. Uh, Uh, start by thanking a few people who are responsible for bringing me here. Um, Congressman Wes Watkins, to start with, uh, Dr. Hanaberry, Dr. Dix, who so kindly uh, picked me up at the airport and has entertained me since I have arrived, uh, Dr. Chancellor, who I had the privilege of meeting today, and um, the only and unique uh, Tony Canvas. Tony and I traveled to Morocco last month and um, had a really great experience spending time together and being in a very unique culture as well. So thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor. It's my first time in Oklahoma. And, and to be here for the last lectureship of uh, Dr. Dix, who I truly admire, and, and he's lying when he's telling you that he's learning from me each time he sees me. There is no truth to that. He is a true inspiration, and we need so many more of him throughout the world. So thank you. So let me turn this on because I'm really bad at staying in one place. And can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. So I have done this presentation countless times this year, probably close to 52 to 57 times. I was trying to, to count on my way here, and I'm sure I missed a few occurrences. But I have presented this to exporters, manufacturers, 
CEOs, CFOs, VP of operations, software engineers, customs official, you name it. And each time, I start my presentation by asking how many people are involved in working across cultures. And each time, I have an ocean of hands that go up. Everybody nowadays, but they want it or not, are working across cultures. And my second question is, how many people here in these other audiences feel that they have been trained to work across cultures? And only once in the Netherlands have I had someone <coughs> raise their hands and say, yes, I did a PhD in it. Every other time, people feel that the education that they received was not preparing them for what they are encountering. So today, I'm going to try to brief you on the very basic of the skills that you will need in the 21st century. Because developing cultural intelligence and, and leading with a global mindset is truly what you will need as you enter the real world as we like to call it when we come from the private sector. The Economist last year really did me a huge favor. They published uh, a special intelligence report and they interviewed 479 executives, mainly Americans, but all from mid to large size companies. And the Economist asked, what do you perceive to be the three biggest challenges for the company in the next 50 years. And across the board, every single one of them said, our workforce doesn't speak enough foreign languages. Our workforce doesn't understand cultural differences. And our company as a whole doesn't understand differing uh, quality standards that different countries need. We don't get it, and that's going to do us in. We are very, very worried about the future. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is truly your challenge. I'm getting older, you're getting younger, and you need to develop those skills. It is a highly competitive world out there. And in order to do well, you will need to understand how to work across cultures. So, let's start. There are some people who ask you, they said, but why do I have to learn? I'm American, I speak English, everybody wants to be just like us. Why do I have to learn anything about it? Look at them, they're coming to us. Why should I? Well, if you haven't noticed, the world has changed. And there are three mega trends that have affected our world. The first one is higher GDP in emerging markets. The second one is young population in these markets. Our population in the West is getting older, me included. Rapid urbanization of the southern hemisphere. So we're going to quickly look at those. By 2020, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is in seven years, because we're already practically in November 2012. So in seven years, the GDP of the developed world will meet the GDP of emerging nation emerging markets. That's tomorrow. The second one is the population. I know that Dr. Dix believes that there will be a major, major catastrophe and we may not get to 9.5 billion people in this world. And I tend to agree with him. But until then, that is the forecast. And if you look at it, you realize that the massive growth of young people is in the southern hemisphere. And by 2050, it has been said that nine children out of 10 under the age of 15 will be in the Southern Hemisphere. Nine out of 10. Imagine all of those people are potential consumer for whatever service or product you will be working on. That's huge. The third one is urbanization. And if we think back and we think about the 20th century, we think, well, where were the big cities of the 20th century? Well, London, with the Industrial Revolution, comes to mind. New York, Chicago, Paris, Berlin. Those were the big cities of the West. And there was only one that was outside of the West, 
Tokyo. Now, let's look at the setting of the 21st century. The ones that are popping up are Lagos, Nigeria, Shanghai, China, Bombay or Mumbai, Sao Paulo, Karachi, Pakistan. Those are the cities of the 21st century, and none of them are located in the Western Hemisphere. This is where the world will be. And that's where you will need to develop your skills in order to truly communicate effectively with people who grew up with different cultural values than you. People who may not understand you under the form of telepathy through assumptions, thinking that they get you and they want exactly what you want. You will have to adjust your mindset to meet their needs and understand their wants. So how can an organization position itself to benefit from the new world dynamics? Because in my opinion, there is nothing to be afraid of. The 21st century is full of opportunities. And it is the world that I have been waiting for. I have lived all over the world. And I especially specialize in emerging markets. I worked for a Taiwanese company when Taiwan was just starting up. I worked for a South African company. I worked for a Brazilian company. And then I started working for North American companies when I moved here. And truly, the emerging markets are so dynamic and so fascinating. It is, it is a different world, and it is leading ours today. So here are my recommendations for companies that want to position themselves when I do this presentation. We need to train to develop that sort of mindset. We truly need to invest in hiring people who come from different parts of the world because they can teach us what kind of product that people want in Nigeria or in Vietnam or in Argentina. You need to listen to them. They know, they know the market, they know what their people want better than you and I do. So include them in your workforce and listen. That's the hard part. I have a lot of clients who have no problem hiring, but they sure don't want to listen. The second one is to lead with cultural intelligence, and that's going to be the meat of our uh, time together today. We need to rethink the way we innovate. We need to pay attention to disruptive innovation. What is disruptive innovation? Well, we have all gone to a clinic and had an x-ray done. When we go to a hospital in the US or in Switzerland, we see a huge apparatus that costs a million dollars it's a huge burden. I mean, for a hospital to have to buy three or four of those machines, right? It's super expensive. Well, guess what? In Pakistan and in India, they don't have a million dollars to put in a clinic. So some very clever engineers developed a portable X-ray machine that cost $500. And it does the exact same job as a million dollar machine. That's what we call disruptive innovation. It is somebody who is penetrating your market with a product that is as good as yours at a price point that you could never, ever have dreamed of. And suddenly, this product is purchased by German hospitals, Russian hospitals, South American hospitals, and you're left with your million dollar machine and nobody wants it any longer. Why should we spend that much money on this? We have options. The other one is a trickle-up syndrome. The trickle-up syndrome is, let's say, I know this guy in, uh, in Nigeria, in fact, who, you know, Nigeria has lots of blackouts still, but people have a lot of cell phones. And the biggest problem that they have is that not every home in the countryside especially has electricity. So how do you plug in your cell phone when you need it? So this guy came up with this fabulous idea, it's a little tablet, and it's a solar charger. So you just stick it out wherever you are, irrelevantly or where you live, and you plug your little cell phone into it, and magically, it gets recharged. I bought one. I have one in my car. It's great. This product is being sold everywhere in the world because we don't have blackout where I live, but it's convenient, and it's great, and it's clever, and it's cheap, and it's affordable. So that is the trickle-up when it comes from a country that may not have the same 
uh, structure, infrastructure that we have, and they cater to their own need, to their own needs, to their own ingeniosity, and then bang, it's like powder. Everybody wants it. Just shh, this is super clever. That is the trickle up syndrome. We don't pay attention to this <coughs> in the West because we don't think that it's applicable. We think that those inventions are for poor people somewhere else. Not true any longer. With technology, you can learn and, and, and be in contact with every product and everything available out there. So companies must pay attention. This brings me to cultural intelligence. It has been said, and I can attest to that because my daughter is eight, but researchers have shown that a child by the age of seven knows in his or her own culture what is right from wrong, what is allowed, what is forbidden. By the age of seven, our cultural <coughs> lenses have been shaped, formed, and we will carry them for the rest of our lives, invisibly in front of us. We will be seeing the world through the cultural lenses that were taught to us during the first seven years of our lives. And it's in conscious. We don't realize it. We think, all of us, that our cultural values are universal. That everybody knows what is self-evident. And then we come in contact with people who come from a very different part of the world, and their cultural lenses are different. And we collide. And we immediately go into the judgment deal. Oh, they are lazy. They, are, they don't want to cooperate. They are stupid. They're not ready for us. You know, don't bother with them. When in reality, it is just the fact that we are wearing different cultural lenses. And through my research, I stumble on the work of Dr. Richard Lewis. In fact, he's not a doctor, he's a sir. He's British. And he devoted his entire life to understanding cultures. And what I love about the work of uh, Richard Lewis is that he first included sub-Saharan African countries. A lot of the work that has been done in the United States does not include African nations because the United States is very, uh, is very new at doing business with Africa. We don't have enough data coming from this country for that, but the British do. So he put together this very visual tool, and I strongly encourage you to download it from the internet. It's free. It's called the Lewis Model, printed in color and put it in a place where you can always have access to. And we're going to show how it works for a little exercise. Pick your country of origin, where you grew up in. For me, it is Switzerland. So I am right here in that big blue corner. And I am described by, Dom by Richard Lewis as cool, factual, and a decisive planner. Let me translate that for you. It means that I'm anal retentive about time. I was born and raised in Switzerland where we manage by the second. It's in my blood. I don't need to wear a watch. I always know what time it is. I'm always on time. If you give me a project, I know that I have to deliver on time and I know. It's part of my cultural DNA. I was also brought up in a culture where we are extremely direct. If you ask me a question, if you invite me to your house, and you say, hey, we just redecorated our house, what do you think about our living room? And I would say, I hate it. <laughs> oh, I hate this house, it's way too dark for Oregon, I'm sorry, I mean, what were you thinking? <laughs> I was taught that I should not do that. <laughs> I have improved. I am a direct communicator. That is my cultural DNA. I come from a culture that is hierarchist. So, if I'm invited to your office, I will wait for you to tell me to sit down. It will never cross my mind to just grab a chair and sit in your office. I don't do that. My first job in Portland, Oregon, I had my entire meeting standing up. Because the guy who hired me saw that I wanted to stand. Otherwise, I would have grabbed the chair, right? And I thought, Jesus, this guy is rude. I mean, I can't believe that. He did not offer me a chair. 
And as I started working for him, every time I would go to his office, he would never offer me a chair. And finally I said, have you ever been taught that you should invite people to sit down? <laughs> and he said, I've been wondering about you. Why don't you ever sit down? <laughs> because you don't invite me. And he said, but you don't need an invitation. You see the chair, right? <laughs> if I didn't want you to sit down, I would remove the chair. <laughs> the chair is there for the asking, Valerie. You just sit yourself down. And I said, why are you but in my culture, that would not be appropriate. So let's continue the exercise by imagining that today, we are receiving a visitor from Turkey. I have never been to Turkey. I have met a few people from Turkey, but I am not an expert on Turkey. I, in fact, know very little about Turkey. But thanks to this visual aid, I can find Turkey right there. And I realized, oh, you know, it's in the orange color. What does that mean? Well, that means that my Turkish visitor will be closer to warm, emotional, loquacious, impulsive. He also will have a little bit of yellow, which is courteous, amiable, accommodating, compromiser, a good listener. And remember who I am? I am the direct communicator who will tell him that his shoes are not good or who will only book 45 minutes for our meeting because time is money? Well, by looking at this chart, I know that I will have to adjust my style. If I want to bond with my visitor, if I want my Turkish visitor to become my customer, I have some work to do. First of all, I need to clear up my calendar because my Turkish visitor will want to spend all day with me. Because my Turkish visitor is about building relationships. I also will have to bite my tongue for probably 10 hours and not talk about business. Because he needs to be the one initiating the business talk. When he feels ready to talk about business with me, he will. Not for me to bring it up. Hey, so what do you think about our product? What about our contract? What do you think about our products? Have you seen my hair? Very good. I cannot do that with him. So, just in a few seconds, I have learned that I need to change who I am to bond with that person if I want success. So do yourself a favor, download it, that's what I did, and take a look at it each time that you know you're going to be in contact with people. And in fact, you know what, you can put it under your iPad. I'm very old school, you don't have to print anymore. So, we talked about it a little bit already when I was describing myself and my visitor. <coughs> Those cultural differences have been put into perspective through the analysis of cultural dimensions. And through my international business development efforts for the past 15 years, I thought that those were really pertinent. There are different schools of thoughts, and we you may encounter uh, some people who integrate with others. That's totally fine. But those are mine, and I think that they go a long way. So social stratification, we talked about egalitarian versus hierarchy. Independence level, are you an individualist, or are you more group-focused in your culture? Business focus, transaction versus relationship. Communication, direct, indirect. Concept of time, is time your friend, or is time uh, uh, a commodity. Time is money. You're always trying to run against the clock, like me. Handling change. Do you resist or do you embrace change? Career orientation. You driven? Is you? Do you live to work or do you work to live? So we're going to look at each of those quickly, unfortunately, because we don't have a lot of time. But I want to give you an example for each of them. So hopefully. They will stick with you. And please excuse me, I have to disrobe because it is so hot in here. <laughs> so let's start with uh, social stratification. Last year, was it already last year? Yes, I guess so. I received a phone call from IBM. IBM is in my town, or not in my town, in fact. And they, there was a, a, a man who called me and he said, listen, uh, somebody give me your phone and number and if you could help me. I don't like to ask for help, but I think I need your help. So could you just come down and help me? So I 
went there and he said, I have this nightmarish guy on my hands. I am in charge of this team, it's a virtual team, and we are working on a $1.2 billion project for my company. And this man is located in Germany. And this man is doing everything he can to sabotage the efforts of the team. I have tried everything I know under the sun. Bad cut, good cut, stretching him to lose his job, whatever. Nothing works. I need you to make an intervention. I need you to work with that guy. I said, okay, you know, can I have his file? Can I take a look at who he is? You know, whatever you have on him, he said, sure, Ben, give it to me. He said, by the way, could I have some information about you? He said, what about me? I'm not the problem here. He is the problem. Why don't you focus your time and energy and money on him? I said, well, you know, it's not the way it works. I need both sides. So I went back to my office. And the first thing I saw is that the guy in Germany has a PhD in software engineering. So I went to the file and looked at my Portland guy. And I noticed that he has a bachelor degree in software engineering. And I thought, ha, ah, I think I know what the problem is. You can stop the billing right here, please. <coughs> so I called Dr. Deet and I said, hey, you know, I was wondering how I could be of assistance to you. I was hired by the company. Um, is there anything that, you know, I could do to make your workplace better? That's all I had to ask. And he said, I want to change team. I want to work for that Mark dude in Portland, Oregon. I hate the guy. He's incompetent and I cannot work for him any longer. I said, okay, tell me more. What makes him incompetent? He doesn't deserve the job he has. The guy has a bachelor degree. He's my boss. I have 20 years of studies and I have been with IBM for two years and I have to report to that guy. I said, okay. So I called my guy in Portland and I said, okay, problem identified. You have never asked the permission, whoever put that team together, when you realize that you have people who come from such a high hierarchy-oriented culture as Germany, and we're going to take a look at the map, look at Germany, all in the gold, hierarchies, just before the gray, which would be a lot of Asian countries, Southeast Asia, that it is very hierarchy-oriented. And let's look at the United States in the red, mainly egalitarian. When you want to put people together, you need to take the time to look at where they are coming from. And you need to realize that those cultural lenses that they come with has shaped their behavior and expectations. And in Germany, Mark would never, ever, ever have become a team leader. With a bachelor degree, never. <coughs> You need a PhD and you need many years of, um, of experience to get there. So when you want to put a team like this together, because it is an American company, what you do is that you need to ask for permission. If the team leaders, the person who put the team together, not Mark, the person at the HR level maybe, if she had called Victor Deed, and she had said to Deed, we realize that you are extremely qualified. We value your knowledge. We, we cherish what you're going to bring to the equation. But I want you to know that the team will be managed by an American gentleman who has been with our company for 20 years. And he brings an incredible amount of experience and know-how in managing teams across cultures. Would it be acceptable for you to report to such a person? What is he going to say? No. I want to work for someone who's less than me. Of course not. He's not stupid. He would have said, okay, you know why? Because as human beings, we need validation. We need to be recognized for who we are. We need the hard work that we have invested in to be recognized, to be glorified, especially in a country that has a lot of hierarchy. That's a very basic step to ask for permission. But guess what? Nobody does. And those billion dollar projects very often fail because of small things like that. Our next dimension is the independence level. Do you come from a country that is